Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines. We are broadcasting live from the beautiful Think Tech Hawaii TV studio in the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. This show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and finding greatness. Today's special guest is a woman that I've known since I was in high school, and I have great respect for her and her family, and she's the author of her new book titled Leading with Aloha. She is Jan Iwase, and today we are going beyond leadership. Hey, Jan. Hi. Thank you so much, Rusty. Great to see you. Oh, well, I'm thrilled to be here. You've you. seen me grow up. I've seen you grow up, and I'm very proud of all you've done. I'm proud of you and your family. Oh, well, thank you very much. Now, I, I read your book over the weekend. Mm -hmm. I loved your book, and we're going to talk about that. Okay. But I had no idea that you grew up in Whitmore Village. I did. I How spent, was it? Well, I spent my first um, 17 and a half years in Whitmore Village. Um, my dad worked for Dole. Uh, it used to be Hawaiian Plantation yeah. Company. and and it turned to dough. And we lived in a little cottage, two bedrooms. There were five of us kids. Um, it was a great place to grow up. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it, you talk about village. It takes a village to raise a child. Well, literally, I literally <laughs> lived in a village. And, um, you know, I learned so much of, about people, about empathy, about perseverance, because these were my parents and their friends and our neighbors were all hardworking people. You know, they worked in the pineapple, village, uh, pineapple plantation and started off as laborers, and they never complained. And, you know, we, we didn't have much. I look back, and I think we were probably could be considered poor, but um, we never felt that way because we had so many other we had experiences and riches that, I think helped to make me into the person I am today. For sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I grew up in Waihawa till uh -huh. I was around seven years old uh -huh. before moving to Mililani. Right. So I know Whitmore Village. <laughs> but um, you worked in the pineapple fields. I did How work was in the that? pineapple fields for five summers. It was hard work. And I do talk about it in my book. I think that's where I really learned about teamwork. Um, you know, the, the, our gang, um, we, we were led by a, an older woman, a grandma type of person, and it was a mixture of old timers who were working as full time workers and us newbies who'd never worked in the pineapple fields before. And when you think about it, you know, after struggling and learning from them on how to persevere and how to continue, um, I think it made me such a strong person. And I learned about teamwork because those ladies, they just really helped to, to persevere and to continue. And um, I owe them a lot. Yeah, and yeah. it didn't matter if you were male or female working in the pineapple fields. I mean, yeah. everyone was pretty much treated the same. Yes. And I think, um, you know, it was hard work, but I think that there's a sense of pride yeah. in being able to um, get through the summer, the whole summer. And like I say in my book, we were, we were earning $1.40 an hour, you know. So when you think about it, you know, it's not a lot of money, but we were, we really worked hard. Yeah. And it gave us, it gave us an inspiration to continue our education because we didn't want to do what our parents had to do to survive and make yeah. a living. Now let's talk about your parents, Jan. Okay. I mean, they're amazing people. Okay. What, what's the biggest thing you've learned from your parents? Well, my parents are amazing people, and I think that anybody who knows our family knows that it started with them. Yeah. You know, they, they made us believe that we could be anything we wanted to be, and they encouraged us along the way. And um, I think we all blazed our own path. There's nobody who has, I mean, my sister was an attorney and a judge. Um, my other sister works for development company. She's their government affairs officer. My brother is, um, he ran Olelo for a while, and now he's with actually the city managing director. Yeah. And my youngest brother actually, you know, like I say, he could have been a, a musician, but he actually is a professor at the University of 
California and Merced, and um, and I'm a principal. Yeah. educator. Yes. And um, I think we all felt very fulfilled in our jobs. We all feel that we did good for our communities. Yeah. And, um, and it started from our parents, really Com instilling in us. I completely <laughs> agree. <laughs> now let's talk about your family now. <laughs> okay. So your husband, Randy, your yes. three sons, Justin, Jaron, and Jordan. Right. Your two grandsons, Jason, Jaden. Right. You are surrounded by boys. I am. How? And you are the glue. <laughs> You are the glue. How did you keep every, everyone together? Well, I enjoyed being a parent. I enjoyed, like I enjoyed teaching, but I enjoyed being a, a wife. Yeah. And um, Randy had goals in his life, which required him to be out of the house more than, than me. And I was, I did do more than my share, I guess. But you know what? I loved it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed picking them up and taking them places, and I enjoyed being their soccer coach or, you know, helping them going out and playing tennis or whatever. And um, I think that having boys really helped me to be a better teacher, actually, because boys are not as, um, I think, especially in elementary school, uh, sometimes we expect our students to be like us, and if you're a female, you were a good student, probably. Yeah. And sometimes boys are a little more active and antsy, and it helped me to really be a better teacher, I think, because I was keeping in mind that we needed to do things differently for all of our students. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Jan, you became an educator, a teacher, mm -hmm. for 45 years. Yes. What, what do you like about teaching? You know, I look back at all the students I've impacted, all of the teachers and staff that I worked with, and um, I, I think that it's such an important job. And I really liked knowing that I had a positive impact on kids and maybe helped them to believe in themselves so they could move forward and um, do great things themselves. And yeah. I think is what we are teachers for, to impact the next generation and to make them believe that they can do good things for our, our, our state and our country. And the last 15 years of those mm -hmm. 45, mm -hmm. you were a principal. And mm -hmm. what did you like about being principal? Well, you know, I never thought about becoming a principal until my principal kind of put that thought in my ear. and. Um, then I realized that I would probably be able to impact more people as a principal um, than as a teacher. Because as a teacher, you have your classroom and you impact those kids, you impact the parents, you know, and help them to realize that they are the biggest support for their students, their kids. Um, but as a principal, you can impact more people. You impact the teachers who then impact the students in their class and you impact all of the the parents at the school as well as the community. So um, I think that's what I enjoyed most about being a principal. And now mm -hmm. you're going to impact more people because mm -hmm. you wrote a wonderful book titled mm -hmm. Leading with Aloha. And mm -hmm. I read it over the weekend uh -huh. and I loved it. Mm -hmm. And you have a big book signing this coming Saturday, August 3rd at Barnes & Noble at Ala Moana, yes. 1 p.m. Yes. So we want everyone to come out there mm -hmm. and uh, buy a book and buy multiple books and get yes. it signed by you. Yeah. Why did you write this book, Jan? Well, when I was getting ready to retire after, you know, and, and please understand that I still loved doing what I was doing, um, but there comes a time when you just have to say, well, it's time to move on and try something different. And so I had made up my mind that I was going to retire at the end of the last school year. And at that time, I was trying to think of what I could do next to impact education. Um, I had a blog. I mean, I'm still keeping my blog. It's about seven years now, and I, I still add to it. And it about, it's about education issues, um, things that I'm concerned about and things that our school did, and just to, to spread the word that good things are happening in schools. And um, the book was an opportunity to share my message with a wider audience and to maybe elevate the discussion about education because um, 
Everybody says that education is a priority for them, but we don't really see it happening. Um, schools are still, you know, having difficulty providing the basic services for their kids, for their students, things like the arts and physical education gets them sometimes put on the side because there isn't enough funding for it. Yeah. And I really believe that we need, as educators, we need to tell our stories because some of these educators have outstanding stories about how they became an educator and why they became an educator and the impact that they've had on, on kids. And the general public doesn't always hear that. So I really want to impact more people by writing this book. And it was a lot harder than I thought it would be. You know, um, you wrote a book. <laughs> yeah. I, I, remember, I respect all authors yeah. <laughs> now after writing a book. I remember what you said um, when we were having brunch, you know, last year. And you said, I thought I was finished with my book, and then I spoke with the publisher, and he said, you know, you really need to kind of change things around, and so you needed to kind of rewrite your book. And you said, I didn't want to do it, but I knew that he was right. Yeah. And that's exactly how I felt about my book. I mean, just, um, you know, Randy said, even if you don't get it published, it'll be there for our kids and their kids, and et cetera. But I really wanted I was hoping that it would it would um, be published because I really want to make a bigger impact on education. And you are, Jen. And mm -hmm. you know, there's in your book you talk about an apple analogy, yes. which I really enjoy. Uh, Can you tell us about that? Okay, so I had an activity with them, um, and and I really don't remember what I was why I was doing it, but I brought a bag of apples, and each group of couple of kids took one apple. And they examined it very carefully. And we talked about, okay, everybody has an apple. You know, are they all the same? And um, they didn't know what I was actually going to be doing with those apples. But what I did was I collected them, and I put them all out, and I said, okay, which one is your apple? And, you know, they examined them very carefully, and they all found their apple because each one was a little bit different. and. I think what that experience really showed them, but it also showed me, was that, you know, everybody is different. And you can't expect to treat every child the same way. And um, that's why relationships are so important in any, any classroom, any school. You know, that relationship between the teacher and the student, the principal and the teacher, the principal and the student, the principal and the parents. You know, it's, you can't, it's not one size fits all. And um, we, the kids, quickly came to realize, wow, you know, I thought that it was just an apple, but it's not. It's a special. It's special. And they, they kept it. They yeah. wanted to keep it because it was theirs. And, um, you know, I think the biggest thing is you don't know what's on the inside. And we need to get to know kids on the inside, not just the outside. And... Um, that was always my passion as a teacher and as a principal to get to know kids. I loved I loved reading that part in your book mm, thank because you. you know people just look on what's on the outside without right. really knowing the story yes. or what they're dealing with on the inside. Exactly. And the beauty that they have. That's right. Jen, uh, before we go to break, I want to ask you, I mean, you've dealt with tons of military families mm -hmm. and special needs Mm -hmm. you know, students, mm -hmm. and you included everybody in mm -hmm. the classes, and you mm -hmm. included the input and involvement mm -hmm. with not just the parents, but the community. Mm -hmm. Why was that so important for you? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, when I became the principal at, it was Halekula Elementary School, we became Daniel K. Inoue in 2016, but it was, it is a military school. And, you know, there is a perception from military families that schools in Hawaii may not be as good as they want for their students. So um, it was very important for me to really get to know the community and to really include them. Um, I really feel that all students need to be included. You know, it doesn't matter if they have special needs, um, because they also have special strengths, yeah. which we need to know. And um, 
many times we overlook that because we label kids. And I'm saying that we shouldn't be doing that. We should look at their strengths first. Because when you do that, you, can, you, you find that they can really contribute to your classroom or to your whole the culture of your school. And it was very important to really include everyone because we had students coming and going throughout the year. Um, one third of the kids were new, one third of the kids left. So, you know, basically in a classroom, you had to, com you had to have this culture of acceptance and including because otherwise those kids who are coming in later will not feel like they are a part of the classroom. And they need to feel that they're a part. If we're going to teach them and they're, if they're going to be learning what we need them to learn. And I think that many times in, in a school, it's not just the academics that we're teaching. We're teaching that social emotional. We're teaching them about getting, getting along with all people and caring and respect for not just each other, but for our school, our community, our planet. I love it. Thank you. Jan, we're going to take a quick break. And then when okay. we come back, we're going to continue going beyond leadership. Thank you. You are watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii with my special guest, Jan Iwase. We will be back in a quick minute. Aloha, I'm Melly James, host of Let's Mana Up. Tuesdays, every other Tuesday, from 11 to 11.30. This show is meant to dive into stories of local product entrepreneurs and how they're growing their companies from right here in Hawaii. I'm so thrilled to have our show kicked off. And so please join us on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock as we talk to local entrepreneurs and hear their stories. Aloha, my name is Wendy Lowe and I want you to join me as we take our health back. On my show, all we do is talk about things in everyday life in Hawaii or abroad. I have guests on board that will just talk about different aspects of health in every, in every way, whether it's medical health, nutritional health, diabetic health, you name it, we'll talk about it. Even financial health, we'll even have some of the Miss Hawaii's on board and all the different topics that I feel will make your health and your lifestyle a lot better. So come join me. I welcome you to take your health back. Mahalo. Welcome back to Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My special guest today has been an educator for 45 years, a school principal for 15 of those years, and she's the author of her new book, Leading with Aloha. She is Jan Iwase, and today we are going beyond leadership. Jan, I know you read my book. I want to know what your thoughts are about my book. I've actually read it three times, Rusty. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I read it when I first got it, um, two years ago, I guess it was. And I just reread it this past weekend because I knew I was going to be on your show. <laughs> <laughs> but I really like your, I like how you um, put your book into a real nice order for anybody to learn your leadership lessons. And I think what I really liked was um, little stories you had. Because those were people, those are kids that Justin and Jaren grew up with. Oh, yeah. And they played against them, and they played with them. And so I really enjoyed those stories. But what I really liked, um, what I remembered a lot of, was your first time going to Creighton. Yep. And your stories about your blister. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the cold weather, playing in the cold weather. And I think that... Those incidents showed me that you didn't give up. Yeah. You know, you realized that you needed to change your mindset and that you had to not make excuses. And I think I saw that throughout your whole career. Yeah. And um, you're still doing it today. So I, I really, I think that, you know, our life experiences really um, dictate how we lead others. And those incidents really what you did. Yeah, and you know, I was Justin and Jaren's private tennis mm -hmm. pro for yeah. many years. Um, yes. From when they started high school. Yes. And you've seen me in action with them. Yes. What are your thoughts about that? You are always, and I know you still are the same way, very, very organized. <laughs> so your lessons were very 
planned out and um, it wasn't just you know on the fly you you knew what you were doing and I think that really helped you make the lessons go well um, I liked how you always had a quote and you always asked them what they thought about that quote I think that it made them think so you are more than just a tennis teacher to them you were really kind of a life coach for them that going ahead you know they knew that you were somebody that they could um, emulate and that you were a friend as yeah. well as their coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my world famous quote of the days. They yes. all love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I liked it because yeah. it helped me as a teacher and as an educator. So yeah. I liked that. Yeah, mm -hmm. the parents would love listening into mm -hmm. those quotes too. Yes. All right. Now, I know, Jan, I mm -hmm. know what the biggest adversity of your life is. Mm -hmm. and. Your second son, Jaron, passed away last year mm -hmm. from chronic kidney disease. Yes. He was 38. He's, he's, I feel like I'm his second father. I feel like I, mm -hmm. you know, he's one of my boys. Yes. Tell me about Jaron. Well, Jaron was our middle child. So he was, um, Justin was uh, not quite two years older, and Jordan was eight years younger than him. Yeah. He was in the middle. He was a, a special child. I think that of my three boys, he was the most, he had the most um, empathy. He was aware of people and of their feelings, and he knew how to um, get them over their funk, if anything, you know? He did that multiple, multiple times with me when um, I would just be feeling maybe a little bit down, and he could sense that, and he would come and talk talk with me and and um, I appreciated that he was very well well aware of people he remembered them he um, we were surprised at the number of people whom he knew and impacted when he passed away you know um, we had no idea um, Darren was a, a very good guy. I mean he had, to, he had to work hard for what he accomplished, not just in tennis, um, but in school. Um, and when he decided to move to Las Vegas, um, it was kind of sad for us because we're used to having him around. And so when he came home that, for that um, winter break, yep. and he went to the his optometrist to have his glass uh, contact lenses renewed and she saw that his eyes were hemorrhaging he she sent him immediately to emer emergency room and they ran a series of tests and when they told us that he had chronic kidney disease stage five caused by high blood pressure I mean we were just floored because we had no idea I don't know if he had any idea that he was sick. They said it's the, um, they call it the silent killer because people don't feel any different when they have kidney disease. But in true Jaron fashion, he changed his lifestyle. He changed his diet. He, he was much more aware of his body. And, um, and we were here and he was there, so we couldn't really talk to him that much about it, but, you know, he was keeping us updated. And, um, you know, May 19, he called us. He had gone on a Pokemon Go raid with his nephews and his brother and some friends, and he was on his way home. And he called us and he said, I have an appointment tomorrow. I told Jace I'd be at his afternoon soccer, soccer match. And we told him we loved him. And that was the last we heard from him. He didn't show up for his appointment. And his brother, you know, his boss called Justin and they went over and he was already, um, he had already passed. Mm -hmm. So it was very difficult. It was very difficult. But I think we chose to remember how he lived, and all the people who shared with us the stories that they had about Darren, the kind things he did, it 
it helped us to. It'll never help us completely heal, but we can. We've gone on with our lives. Yeah. No, I'm. I you asked me to speak at his yes. celebration of life, and uh -huh. there must have been a thousand people there. I mean, yeah. it was so. There were so many people. Yeah. And then I went with you and your family to mm -hmm. the city council when they had the vote yes. unanimously to yes. name Central Oahu Regional Park the, the tennis complex yes. for Jaron. Yeah. And that's that's amazing. I mean, Jaron was such a likable boy, mm -hmm. so much fun, mm -hmm. so genuine. I mean, mm -hmm. he just made everybody feel better about themselves. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I miss him tremendously. And I I know Rusty that throughout. I mean, he would tell us. When he saw you, um, he was very proud of all that you had done. And you were the coach for an opposing team. I mean, you were Punahou, he was Iolani, but he was still very proud to say that you were his teacher, his coach. Yeah. And, um, and I think he learned a lot from you. I know, at that time, I had, Jan, I had, I was privately coaching five of the Iolani top boys <laughs> yeah. on their varsity. <laughs> And the number one Iolani girl. Yeah. <laughs> no, but Jaren's legacy is going to live on yes, forever. Yes. Indeed. Jen, I want to ask mm -hmm. you, um, so, you know, resiliency. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, you and your family have to be resilient. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, military families through the years, they have to be resilient. Mm -hmm. How important is resilience? Resilience is very, very important. And I think I learned that from my parents, you know. Um, they never, never, never let us get through the easy way. You yeah. know, they made us realize that anything worth doing was worth um, working hard for. Um, I think I learned resilience from our students, actually, my, yeah. especially my military students. Well, also with my Head Start students, you know, because those parents, even if they were uh, from low-income, underachieving um, families, they wanted the best for their kids, which is what our parents wanted for us. I'm sure your parents wanted for you as well. When I think of our students and the challenges that they went through, um, having to move schools, sometimes in the middle of the year, sometimes yeah. moving several times in the middle of the year, when I think of a parent being deployed, you know, and in harm's way, and the parent who was remaining if there was a parent. Sometimes it was a single soldier who was deployed and that child was sent to live with neighbors or something. Those kids had to be resilient and they were. I learned it from them. They were strong. Those parents were strong. I know that they were having challenges. So we were trying, we were there to, to support them. But um, ultimately they were the ones who were living it. Um, I don't think I could ever understand that until Jordan was deployed to Afghanistan yeah. as in, the, in the Air Force, and he wasn't in combat. But, you know, you worry. And so I learned resilience from them. I learned that you can be strong and that um, being strong, that even, that even crying is not a sign of weakness. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and so... I know. I let's think. just let's just have everybody be resilient and, yeah. and be authentic. Mm -hmm. And Jen, I gotta I gotta <clears throat> say, thank you so much for joining me on the show today because you are such a positive person. You have great energy. I mean, your mm -hmm. whole family, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm just amazed how all of these years you're the one woman <laughs> surrounded by all the men. I really want to thank you for your insights. Oh. And Thank best you. of luck with the book. And again, everyone can come and meet you yes. this Saturday, August yeah. 3rd, uh -huh. Barnes & Noble, Ala Moana at 1 p.m. Okay. Thank you so much, Rusty. And I have learned so much from you. And keep doing this program because I enjoy it a lot. And I'm oh. sure a lot of people do. Thank you, Jen. Okay. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii, and a special thank you to my clothing sponsor, Iolani Incorporated. For more information, please visit RustyKomori.com, and my book is available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble.
I hope that Jan and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.